we can still educate so and we can still get people together and also uh, nice to be able to offer this and nice to have you all uh, here with us so I guess with this, uh, I will officially get started. And uh, we are, as I mentioned before, we are recording the call. Um, and uh, it will be available once it's processed. We'll pop it up on our YouTube in case you have to duck out or um, technology uh, does technology things for, for you. We had somebody who missed an entire uh, program we were doing earlier in the summer because their technology just totally failed. So it does happen. As long as it's not mine, <laughs> everything should work out all right. So uh, hopefully you're all seeing my uh, screen here. Mm -hmm. um, and so our program today is called Not Your Ordinary Weed, uh, mm -hmm. looking at the famous Japanese knotweed. Uh, just a couple of Let's see if that's going to present now. Where's my presentation? There we go. Um, I, I generally do ask during the presentation if you would mute yourself, um, and that just prevents uh, sometimes my voice comes through your speakers and back into your microphone, or you know you get the dog barking or uh, somebody eating potato chips or something like that. Um, you can say hello using the chat feature. I think several of us have said hello already. Um, Generally, it's easier to just use the, the chat window to ask questions, but we are a small enough group, so I don't necessarily mind if, you know, you have a pressing question, if I ignore, you know, if I, I shouldn't say ignore, but if I miss the chat um, window, then you can, you know, pop in um, and you can ask questions at any time. I may defer on a question to a later point, depending on whether it's on my list of things to talk about later. Um, but that's it. So I, we shall make it official. Uh, first off, I think most of you are familiar with Otsego County Conservation Association. Uh, we are a private, not-for-profit organization based out of Cooperstown. We do try to work throughout the county. Um, we were formed in 1968 by a group of citizens who were concerned with sustainable forestry issues. And as often happens with not-for-profits, our mission and our scope of operation grew over time based on you know, the interests of the board and the staff, as well as the needs of the community. Uh, we currently have a full-time staff of three and one part-timer year-round plus uh, seasonal interns who, who come in and out. Um, and uh, you know, we, our, our programs include things such as recycling and solid waste, clean heating and cooling technologies, invasive species, municipal planning, and I say that education is part of everything that we do. Uh, just quickly about me, that's me. That, that's actually a slightly old picture. Um, I was a wildlife science major in college who found education during a summer job and really enjoyed it. Um, I have, gosh, 30 plus years already in the field, which boggles my mind. Uh, I've been officially with OCCA as an employee since 2013, though I have worked with the organization in sort of consulting capacities and partner capacities since we moved up here in 2003, I guess. And I guess I've been fighting knotweed since 2015, though I remember noticing it many, many years ago on Long Island and kind of thinking, what is that plant? Uh, so, so that brings us to the, the general gist of our program. Uh, we will cover these four areas, a general introduction to invasive species, which will be very brief. Uh, we'll go into some of the background on Japanese knotweed, where it comes from, what it does, why it's a nuisance, uh, its impacts on the landscape, and getting into some of those control issues uh, and how, how to do it or how to try to do it, uh, since it is an effort. Okay. Uh, so first off, our introduction to invasive species, I can never resist putting these old movie posters in because uh, it's just kind of fun. Um, you know, we think of invasives as something big and scary. You know, there were all those horror movies of the 50s and 60s about, you know, space invaders coming in to, you know, kill off humanity. Um, so, you know, that colors our thinking on invasive species. Uh, in a way, they're a lot worse because the invasive species that we have are from here <laughs> and uh, you know they're real as opposed to these uh, you know monster movies and things. So when we talk about invasive species our, our official definition is that they are organisms that are not native to the environment you're looking at. So in our case central New York, New York, the United States um, and their introduction 
causes or is likely to cause harm to any one of the environment, the economy, and or human health. So if a species is not native to the environment in question and it's going to harm any one of those three, it can be considered an invasive, right? And there are some species that, that have been introduced into the country that have, you know, they've set up viable populations, they live here and they don't really disrupt anything and they're just considered, they would be considered an alien or a non-native. Um, whereas there are other species that, that just have a, a massive impact. And, you know, we tend to think of it as being, you know, one of overpopulation. Uh, certainly that's something when we look at Japanese knotweed, we say it's taking over, but it's not always a case of it taking over uh, just again, as much as the disruption that it can cause on, again, the environment, the economy and or human health. Okay. So with that, we come into Japanese knotweed. Okay. And, and we'll, we got a, we got somebody else in. Uh, welcome, Doug. We are just getting started. So just delving into uh, our start about Japanese knotweed. Okay. Uh, so this is knot knotweed. And, and I should have asked beforehand, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Japanese knotweed, but every so often we get people who say, well, no, I don't, I don't really know what it is. Um, if you're not super familiar with it, if it's something you've heard of, but don't really know much about, then after this program, you will probably say, oh my gosh, I'm seeing that everywhere because that's, that's typically how, how these things go. Okay, uh, okay. so um, about Japanese knotweed, what we're seeing here in this image is actually sort of the native habitat for Japanese knotweed. Okay. Um, it is native to the J Japanese islands, parts of China, the Korean Peninsula, uh, far eastern Russia, um, and it grows very typically in this sort of environment, a volcanic slope. Uh, it's a, a, oh, there we go. I'll, I'll add these uh, in. Okay. Uh, and when we talk about Japanese knotweed, we are actually talking typically about three species of plant that look more or less the same and behave the same. And so we can effectively treat them as one. Uh, the three species are Japanese knotweed proper, uh, which uh, you know, there are three Latin names there because they change all the time. And I'm still not certain if it's currently Fallopia japonica or Renutria japonica. It used to be Polygonum cuspidatum, but they, they zorched that. But if you're looking up information on Japanese knotweed, you may see it referred to by any of those three names. Okay. Uh, there's also giant knotweed, which is Fallopia sash... Uh, I, didn't I didn't practice my pronunciation. Uh, um, yeah. Fallopia sacalinensis, and then there's Bohemian knotweed, which is a hybrid actually of the giant knotweed and the Japanese knotweed. Okay, and we do have all three in our area. Um, we'll talk a little bit about recognizing them uh, from each other, but it, again, it's really not that important because they are functionally the same plant. Okay, it is a member of the buckwheat family, the Polygonaceae. We have a number of buckwheats native to um, uh, the United States, some of them are, are crops, some of them are, you know, some minor weeds of the lawn, um, nothing, nothing like uh, this. It is a pioneer plant, as we see from this image, where it's, again, growing in volcanic ash on active volcanic slopes. Uh, it also grows well on, in its native range, on gravel deposits in stream beds, um, along ditches, and at the edges of um, at the edges of forested areas. And it's a perennial. So it dies, you know, the vegetative portion will die off at the end of the year, uh, but the root system remains intact. And this, for the multiple years, it will just keep growing off of that same uh, root system. Okay. Uh, so more about Japanese knotweed. The, na the name in Japan is, and I'm trying to make sure I pronounce this right, Itadori. Uh, I got it sort of right. Uh, which seems to refer to uh, words that mean pain puller. Okay. It does have some medicinal uses. Um, I've, and I've heard from other people who have told me that they use it for treatment of Lyme disease symptoms and arthritis. Um, clinical studies are not super conclusive on that right now, but uh, there, there is some evidence that it works for people. Okay. Uh, it was introduced to Europe by Philip Franz von Siebold, who is one of these 
mid 1800s Renaissance men. He was a, a physician with the military. He uh, was also a botanist who uh, was one of the first Western botanists who was allowed to catalog the plants in Japan. Uh, he came back with a definitive collection and one of those plants was Japanese knotweed. He uh, introduced it into the Royal Gardens in England as well as other places in Europe in the middle 1800s. Okay. And it was originally promoted as an ornamental. It was very widely used on estates because of its appearance, um, livestock forage and soil stabilization. The, uh, where is it? I have a quote here. The 18, 1907, excuse me, Biltmore nursery catalog called Japanese knotweed, a bold, handsome plant, four to six feet tall, white flowers, small but very numerous, which bloom in great clouds, producing a very soft and pleasing effect. Uh, also considered very hardy and desirable. Uh, it wasn't long after 1907 that people started recognizing it as uh, more difficult and soon the language on it changed from very hardy and desirable and these nice, you know, soft, fluffy, cloud-like, you know, flowers to noxious weed. Okay, um, and I also believe that there was a drought condition in England at one point in which case, where they discovered that livestock would forage on it. The knotweed was, uh, was surviving in drought conditions and the livestock were eating it. So then they started promoting it in that way. And also as soil stabilization, somewhat ironically. Okay. Um, in the United States, it, it was first seen around Philadelphia and Schenectady in the middle to late 1800s. Uh, it is now currently found in 42 states, uh, largely unwanted, I believe as well as eight Canadian provinces and many, many places throughout the world. And it is edible. Okay. Um, generally, you're not going to eat it at this time of year, but my understanding is you, you uh, harvest the fresh shoots early in spring, and I think you need to do some boiling of that to, to remove some of the bitter flavor. Um, but a lot of people do like it. It's somewhat asparagus-like. Okay. Uh, so we'll take a look here um, at the introduction to, to what does it look like, uh, the most definitive characteristic. Uh, it's frequently referred to as bamboo because of the stem. It is not bamboo. Bamboo is basically a, a giant grass, okay? um, whereas uh, a knotweed is a, a, um, a dicot. Uh, it has, has different leaf structure, different, uh, some other different structures. But it does have that kind of bamboo-like stem. It's very smooth, typically green, sometimes with kind of reddish spots or streaks on it. Uh, it does have those distinctive nodes. And I'm not sure if you can see my cursor going back and forth right here. These little horizontal lines on the stem are the nodes. Okay? And typically, that's where either a branch will uh, arise from or the leaves. Okay. And it's hollow except at the nodes. So if you cut it, if you cut it open, you cut it in half, you'll, you'll be able to look through it or you can cut a section out. Okay. In winter, uh, the above ground parts of the plant typically do not, well, they, they, they die, but they remain standing. And you see it at this time, you know, in the winter, it's kind of the skeletal uh, bone white or brown kind of rattling uh, this is not the greatest picture, but and towards the tips, you'll often see the old flower and seed spikes uh, kind of poking up into the sky. Okay. In terms of appear appearance, the leaves are typically heart-shaped or triangular at the base. They're somewhat lance-shaped or, or slightly oval. You can see that there is a bit of a variety in there. Smooth margin, and note there's an asterisk, and we'll come back to that. So there are no teeth on the margin. So no teeth or spines off of the margin, and they are hairless. So no hairs, no fuzz, no, no coatings. Okay. Uh, here's just a quick look at, at several different leaves off of a couple of different knotweed plants. So you see a little bit of the variety. So one of the other things I, I mentioned when I said it's not a bamboo, you notice that our leaves on our knotweed have little leaf stalks where they attach to the stem whereas a bamboo has a grass type of blade or a corn, like corn, uh, a corn leaf that arises, you know, from surrounding the stem as opposed to off of a, a short stalk. Okay, so these leaves here, this is on our, our 
Japanese knotweed or possibly Bohemian knotweed. It's tough to tell the difference between those two. Uh, the biggest one here is about almost 10 inches long. Some of them are pretty small, two or three inches long. Uh, again, some of them are more lance shaped or broadly triangular and a couple of them are a little bit more rounded. Okay. And then this is a leaf of giant knotweed. And if you wanna see giant knotweed over by uh, Cooperstown School, um, kind of across the road there is a huge stand of it. There's a pile of uh, corrugated plastic pipes by the uh, uh, village um, uh, maintenance sheds there and th there's some. So you see that the leaf looks very different. Now I said that it's a smooth edged leaf and you see here on our giant knotweed, this is very wavy. It almost looks toothed. It's not a toothed edge, but because it's wavy, it's kind of crinkly, it makes it look toothed. And this leaf is probably about they could be up to about a foot long or so, a foot or more long, and they can get pretty broad sometimes. This one's a little more narrow, but that's our giant knotweed there. Okay. At this time of year, you will start to see flowers. So in Otsego County, typically flowering begins in August and will carry through into September. Um, right now, this, this picture was actually taken about two or three days ago, and the flower clusters are, will rise up from the stems along the uh, along the stem, um, it's a starts out as sort of this tight whitish kind of cluster, and as the season goes on and we get a little more uh, later in the flowering season, those flowers kind of become a little bit looser in appearance and and more of that fluffy cloudy spray that they were talking about in the uh, in the Biltmore catalog. Okay, so that's our general appearance. I don't have a picture of the seeds, but you know, beginning in September or so, you'll start to see small triangular brownish seeds. And the interesting thing is there's some debate over how viable those seeds are, um, whether they are actually um, able to be uh, uh, grown from seed or whether the plant is reproducing exclusively by vegetation, vegetatively. Okay, so again, we're back in that native habitat and we look at this plant that is part of a community in, in Japan, part of what they call the giant herb community, uh, where it, it fits in with the, the local environment. How do we go from that to what has been described as the world's worst invasive plant? Okay. Um, this is not local, this, this photo, I'm not quite sure where that one's from, but we certainly see scenes like this here in Otsego County. Okay. So to do that, we want to look at some of the, the abilities of the plant. And first off, we know that it can tolerate a wide range of conditions. So in Japan, you know, I, I look at volcanic slopes and I, I think that that would be a very difficult place to say, but they, they generally say that it prefers moist environments, but it's capable of, of surviving in drought conditions. Uh, it can tolerate a wide range of pHs from the low to mid three pH of around three, which is a pretty acidic soil up to around 8.5. So wide range of soil conditions, wide range of moisture uh, conditions. It can tolerate salinity. Um, it can tolerate, again, acids and heavy metals. And while it tends to like sun, it can also grow in shaded environments. It usually won't go, it usually won't grow on its own in the depths of a forest. But if it's a, you know, a patchy sort of light forest, it can, it can grow in there, okay? Um, it grows early and rapidly. So knotweed in our area can, if it's warm enough, will begin growing in late March or early April, okay? A lot of frequently before you start to see um, other ground vegetation popping up. And when I say it grows rapidly, we're talking about multiple inches a day. It can grow about a foot a week early in the growing season. So it, it puts on a lot of height um, and a lot of bulk in a short amount of time. And by doing that, it creates shade that prevents some of our other native plants uh, from growing. Okay. And it can reproduce vegetatively. So pieces, fragments of the above ground plants, the stems can uh, be broken off and transported to other places and it can grow from that. It can also grow from the rhizomes, which we're gonna talk about in a second. One other thing I forgot to mention here and forgot to put on my slide is that uh, Japanese knotweed is also uh, exhibits alleopathy, 
which is it produces chemicals in the ground that help suppress other vegetation. So it's waging chemical warfare on uh, other plants. And Maureen, you were mentioning your walnut. Walnut trees do the same thing. So um, they, they try to suppress some of the competition. Okay, so this is a, uh, a, a fella who was working with us from a couple of years ago. It's not the best slide. Um, in his right hand over here, he's holding a Japanese knotweed plant that he dug out of the ground. We see some of the root system here. In his left hand, whoops, let me go back. Uh, sorry. I sometimes have trouble with uh, tapping the screen. Uh, in his left hand, he is also holding a, uh, a, a plant that he dug up and between them, you see this little thin runner that goes across. It's a, probably about two feet long. That is a rhizome. Rhizomes are sort of horizontal underground root systems. Um, and periodically on the knotweed, it will arise a little cluster of buds that will send up vegetative stalks above ground. You can also see off of his left hand, there are two more rhizomes extending off of here. And each one of these is probably about two feet long or so. Okay. So a, a single knotweed plant will start to produce these rhizomes, which will in, in turn produce multiple clusters or canes of the plants above ground. Rhizomes can extend 20 to 40 feet out from the center plant, which enables it to pretty much travel effectively underground for a distance, which is why sometimes you'll see plants growing up sort of in the middle of a field uh, because they could be potentially uh, you know, running alongside from, from another plant elsewhere. Okay. Um, and that makes it pretty difficult. Uh, when we look here, if you see on, this is a rhizome here, the rhizomes become very tough and very woody. Uh, the circled areas, those little orange, they look like little buds and that's basically what they are. So arising at period, you know, here and there on the rhizomes are little vegetative buds that can produce uh, either other rhizomes or actual stalks that will grow up above the ground. Okay. And this is part of why you need to be very, very careful if you're doing any removal work. If you're leaving pieces and parts in the ground, you can end up with knotweed popping up fresh again. Okay. Now knotweed will also frequently send, and this is again slightly unclear, but they'll frequently send a, a root deep straight down. This one was probably about a foot and a half long and it broke, unfortunately. But you can see that, uh, you know, kind of twisting around depending on obstacles in the, uh, in the soil. And this white spot right by my cursor is where it broke. So the unfortunate thing is there's more of the root underground that can potentially, um, that can potentially sprout up again. Okay. We had uh, some volunteers from, from SUNY out helping us dig up knotweed. And uh, I think the, about the longest rhizome somebody was able to get was about six feet long before it broke. And she was working on it for probably a good half hour trying to get this huge long rhizome out of the ground. Okay. So those rhizomes really are, are, are a big part of what enables knotweed to, to spread and to become such a, a, a dense uh, plant. Okay. So let's take a look at, at some of those impacts as a result of that. Um, so a single plant will send out these rhizomes and, and shoot up vegetation. Uh, this entire collection here could conceivably be one plant, basically a clone, uh, a clonal colony, effectively. Okay. Um, and this is actually out in, uh, where were we? Out in, towards New Berlin. Uh, this particular cluster of knotweed was pretty large and was over my head. Um, and if you look on the ground, you see that there's pretty much nothing there. So some of those impacts where knotweed is growing, it reduces diversity and abundance of vegetation, insects, and wildlife as a result of that. Okay, so again, looking on the ground there, you don't see anything growing but more knotweed coming up. Okay. Um, my experience, you know, I haven't done scientific studies on it myself, but about the only thing I ever see eating the Japanese knotweed are Japanese beetles and they don't seem to do a huge amount uh, to it. You know, you find sometimes find some snails on it um, and some spiders, which don't eat the knotweed. Um, I do know that the flowers are widely pollinated, so the flowers are, are, are good for some of the pollinators, but uh, the plant itself 
is harming diversity. Okay. Um, the, the canes, when they fall, are very durable and the nutrients are not well cycled through the soil system. So what you're ending up with is a, a decrease in quality of your soil beneath the knotweed okay, and a change to moisture regimens. And the effect of this is that it alters the ecosystem structure. So knotweed in our, in, in our area frequently grows along riverbanks and riparian corridors. And some of the studies are indicating that in addition to reducing the native herbaceous vegetation that you would normally find along the stream banks or in these corridors, it's also inhibiting the growth of new trees and changing what would might be a forested riparian corridor to an herbaceous riparian corridor that is dominated by the Japanese knotweed. Okay. So this is some of those biological impacts. Okay. Um, ironically, even though you see it growing so thickly along our stream bank here, uh, it, it results in increased soil erosion, particularly in the winter. Uh, as, as if you've experienced this, the knotweed will die back in the winter. It'll leave those canes up, you know, standing up there, but the soil itself becomes exposed to rain events or to scouring from the stream. That actually is a stream. It doesn't seem to be moving very quickly. Okay. Um, so scouring from, from rainwater and from uh, stream water is going to carry soil away, um, re resulting in eroded banks, deposition further downstream. And that also can help the knotweed itself spread as, it, as the uh, water scours at the, the base of the knotweed roots, it's gonna pull pieces of the rhizomes out and float them downstream where they may find a new place to, uh, to uh, establish which is part of why if you look at knotweed distribution on stream channels, you'll often see a patch and then downstream a patch and a patch and a patch kind of leapfrogging itself as, as you go down. And then there's uh, issues related to infrastructure and public safety. Uh, this is not the clearest photo on the right, but we see a pile of Japanese knotweed that's growing up, potentially obscuring the road sign, also growing out over the guardrail and into the right of way. Bicyclists on this road or pedestrians on this road are going to try to avoid that and move into, you know, potentially move into traffic. Um, idiots like me are going to take photos of it as we drive by, a, a definite risk to public safety. Um, so it, it kind of skewer visibility on road surfaces, um, interfere with, with signage, etc. And then from infrastructure standpoint, you know, I think we've all seen plants growing in some remarkable places and we see that plants can grow in little tiny cracks in the sidewalk, let's say, where there's a little bit of soil and a little bit of moisture. The Japanese knotweed will make its own hole. And basically the rhizome that's, that's creeping underneath the road surface pops up and can punch right through uh, the road surface. And we see it degrading road edges. Uh, it can undermine foundations in homes and retaining walls and such because it, it, it's, it's very powerful. And how it decides that it wants to kind of push up through the asphalt, I, I don't know, um, but it, it can find a way and it can, it can uh, do that sort of uh, damage to the infrastructure. Okay, and then there's also issues with recreation, uh, stream banks that people might want to go fishing at. It's difficult to get through. If you've been on some hiking trails, uh, you go down like at the uh, Oneonta Susquehanna Greenway down there in Oneonta. Part of those trails have very, very high knotweed, very, very you know intrusive knotweed growing out over the over the trails. So um, you know it can interfere with recreational opportunities as well, and thus economics. Okay, so we'll come to control. Um, I always use this image for knotweed control because it's it's such a, a difficult task and. When we first took on some of our projects at OCCA, I think I, I was feeling a little like Don Quixote there and you know, kind of a little fruitless in some ways, but we're learning some things as we go. And, and so there, there's some room for encouragement here. Okay. Um, I did wanna add this, um, the invasion curve. So our, our uh, vertical axes show uh, increasing area infested on one side and control costs. So as an area, the area infested increases, the cost to control it are gonna go up, okay? Um, and with time, you go from a small infestation that could be eradicated uh, to something that your chances of, of success 
become lower and lower as your area of infestation goes, goes up. Okay. Unfortunately for knotweed, we're probably about there. Okay. It is so widespread in New York state and the US that, that eradication on a, on a nationwide scale or a state scale are, are pretty much impossible. However, um, what our goals should be really are about containment and keeping it from spreading to new areas. Uh, and also, as it says, local eradication is possible. Okay, so if you have a new infestation on a property um, and it's small, it is possible to get rid of it. So let's look at some of the methods uh, that people can use to uh, control it. There are three basic uh, methods, chemical, mechanical, and biological. Um, typically, uh, well, typically what I will say with knotweed is it's going to require some combination uh, of, of all three or, or two out of three uh, because this plant is so persistent and so difficult to, uh, to deal with. Okay. So if we look at our chemical controls, these are you know, your typical herbicides and things. This is actually not a picture of somebody treating Japanese knotweed because I don't have any pictures of that. Um, this is a different invasive uh, that was being treated. But uh, for chemicals, typically right now, um, this is about doing your research is what I always tell people. So know your plant, know your target plant and find out what it is that needs to be needs to be used. If you need to go chemical route, um, the, you find the proper product. Uh, typically for, for Japanese knotweed, the recommended chemicals are glyphosate based, which are not popular uh, for various reasons, okay? but they are the ones that are most effective. Okay? But you find the right one and you find, you know, it's not a matter of necessarily going out to the store, buying a jar, you know, buying a bottle of Roundup and, and spraying it. Okay, this is some, some different things. Um, you need to look at the proper timing. So, you know, are you going out there in April or are you going out there in June? Typically for herbicide applications, they recommend store, uh, treating after July, after the beginning of July. And all, all control, pretty much, whether it's chemical or uh, mechanical, is based on disrupting the flow of nutrients into the root system. Okay, um, so when the knotweed begins growing in April or so, it's sending up all the stored energy from the root system into vegetation. Okay, um, the idea is then to, in the fall or late summer, the plant then starts shipping all the, the food that it's been making all summer back into the roots to provide uh, for next year's growth. So you want to disrupt it before it gets to store that food into the roots. Okay, so herbicide treatments typically will happen after July. Um, and the idea there is that the, the chemicals themselves are being pushed down into the roots by the plant and affecting the roots, the entire thing, right? So it doesn't do any good to, to kill one cane, let's say, when there's a whole colony there. So timing is, is very important for, your, for chemical treatment. And there's also a question of methodology. Um, foliar spray, which you, know, you think of as you know, wide, wide spray on the vegetation versus uh, what are known as um, basal bark or, or stem injection types of, of applications. They're all, they're all different. You need to do your research and figure out if you're going this way, what the uh, best approach is. Okay. Um, you read your labels carefully and follow directions. Uh, one of the issues with a lot of the herbicides, of course, is that they can affect non-target organisms or they can get into the water systems and we do not want that. So that's part of why you, re you know, that's part of why you do your research and it's part of why you follow those labels to a T. Okay. If in doubt, consult a professional. So on small patches of Japanese knotweed, you probably do not need to use uh, herbicides, but if you're talking about large areas that it's not feasible to use another method, this is where, where this would come in. Okay. Um, it typically requires cutting, and um, the reason for this is if, if you're waiting until, say, after July 1st to use your chemicals, you're looking at knotweed that is six, eight feet tall or 15 feet tall if it's um, something like uh, the giant knotweed. 
um, you don't want to have to try to get in there to spray something that size. By cutting it at least once in the season, you will have much less growth to wade through or to spray on. Okay, I do know somebody who has sprayed some patches and he said in one, the first year they were spraying patches that were again about six or eight feet high. He said the, the following year they had cut it down first and he said we used a lot less chemical um, the, the second year when they, when they sprayed over cuts, um, you know, uh, previous cutting. Okay. Um, and this is probably going to require multiple years. The one thing about herbicides is a lot of people, I think, think, oh, I, can, I just need to use this once and that's going to solve my problem. Uh, probably not with Japanese knotweed because, again, you're dealing with a very extensive root system. And while it may well be all interconnected, it, you're probably going to miss some, basically. Some of the chemicals are not going to get in to all of the roots. So, you know, year two, you, you will see regrowth, hopefully less vigorous. Um, you know, and again, so you're you're looking at at least two years, maybe as many as five. Okay, um, we're going to talk talk about mechanical uh, methods, cutting and or digging. Uh, this is something that we have done at OCCA, and I know Maureen has uh, been been doing some uh, as well. Uh, this is a very labor intensive um, effort. Okay, uh, but it can work. So some tips on this is to start early. So if your knotweed is growing beginning in April, you know, you don't want to, one of the things that we did is we waited till June when, when this fella here is cutting, this is in June and this stuff is probably four feet high already or so. So cutting four foot high knotweed is, is, you know, easier than cutting 12 foot high knotweed, but it's still, you know, it would be easier probably to come out in May or late April and cut it down when it's a few inches tall and then do it a second time. Um, but yeah, so you want to start early before it gets too big because then it becomes very difficult to handle. Okay. Also, the canes themselves, once they get to a certain, when you cut them, they often have sharp edges on them and it can be a little difficult to handle. Okay. You also want to cut often. You're looking at least two times per month, particularly early in the season. Okay. Um, and then again, you would want to continue cutting. If, you're, if you want to just do cutting and digging, you will continue that through the end of the season, right? It, you probably won't need two times per month once you get into July, but you'd want to come back at least one more time probably and cut it. Um, as for digging, that is easy, a little more easily done once you've cut down some of those stalks and you can try to pry up the root masses and, and dig out the rhizomes. Okay. Uh, remove and properly dispose of all plant parts. And we'll talk about this. The leaves themselves are not so much of a problem, but any parts of the stem, any parts of the root masses, you need to make sure you are cleaning up um, and disposing of properly. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. And then you thoroughly clean equipment and that includes your shoes so that you're not inadvertently transporting uh, knotweed bits from one place to another when you, when you walk across your property. Okay. and prepare for the long haul. So how many years are you, are you gonna do this? Uh, we started a small project at OCCA in 2015. It's still coming back. What we can see is that it is less vigorous than it was when we started. So we're on the right track. But again, it's, it's a long-term process. Any, any sort of invasive species control, and particularly with this plant, is going to be a long-term process. Okay. And as I mentioned, cutting alone may not work. Okay, just because um, depending on the size of the infestation and how much, you know, sweat basically you're willing to put into it. But if you, if you are cutting and combining with herbicide, that can also be pretty uh, effective. Okay, most people will tell you that cutting alone is not going to work. Okay, and one of the things when I talk about cutting, uh, you can use mowers, you can use string trimmers, but you have to be really careful with those because they tend to fling plant parts all around. And so what we typically do is we go in there with loppers and, and hand pruners and, and cut all of this stuff by hand. Okay. Um, mowers, again, tend to fling pieces around and so you may end up spreading the plant if you're, if you're using that and not being really careful. Okay. Um, regarding disposal, uh, DEC does have guidelines for how to dispose of invasive plant material. Uh, uh, I don't have it handy to post in chat. Um, I will try to do it if I can. 
um, but it is available on the Department of Environmental Conservation's website uh, and it includes just a, a list of the proper ways to do it. Generally what we would recommend for disposal is to take all of your cuttings of knotweed, uh, bag them, you want to put them in thick black plastic garbage bags and leave them in the sun for a couple of weeks. And this is essentially going to cook them and should hopefully liquefy them and then you can dispose of them in the trash. Okay. Um, but you want to be careful again when you're cutting the, the knotweed that it's not poking holes in the bag and allowing some air to get in there. That stuff can survive a, a ridiculous amount of time um, if, you, if you don't have it tied up tightly. Okay. Do not compost. Uh, this is very important. Uh, there are some studies that indicate that uh, a really high functioning compost operation, a commercial composting operation might be able to kill this stuff off. Uh, but if you're, you know, if, if it's your home compost, it probably does not reach the temperatures for the amount of time that is needed. And if you're putting it in your compost and, and then spreading your compost, you're probably going to spread knotweed. Likewise, any, there are not a whole lot of facilities here. I think there's, there's some composting available in Oneonta. Don't put knotweed in the compost for that with, with food scraps, because again, it will probably end up spreading. Okay. Um, likewise, don't bring it to the green waste uh, facility or leave it, if you happen to have a community that will pick up green waste and yard clippings, don't throw Japanese knotweed in there because it will probably end up just spreading it to, and making it somebody else's problem. Okay, so best bet, bag it, solarize it, um, and then dispose of it in the trash once it is you know, sufficiently rotten. Okay. Uh, an alternative to this, if you have the space, is that you can air dry it um, if you can keep the plants off of the soil. Uh, we have the, the greenhouse at Mohican Farm and we were able to spread some of our vegetative parts out in the greenhouse and effectively it just dried it into nothing. Um, so if you have a, a, an impervious surface, uh, and you can be sure that the plants are not going to get moved over to uh, you know some other soil surface or something like that. You can spread it out nice and thin in the sun um, and let it air dry. Okay. This does not work super well for the roots. The roots would really need to be um, uh, bagged and solarized. Okay. So again, see the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation guidelines. Um, and I will try to post that in the chat right as before we go. Okay. So another mechanical method would be barriers. Uh, this is uh, somebody is trying this up uh, on Route 205. Uh, essentially, black plastic sheeting is typically the best thing to spread out over the knotweed area. You want to cut it down to ground level. Um, and spread your, spread your uh, plastic out across the top of it, weigh it down, keep it from, from uh, lifting up. You know, mulching across the top of it is generally good too. Uh, heavy black plastic, seven mils. Okay? Um, and this is depriving sun and there may be some cooking going on too as the sun is kind of heating that black plastic. Okay? Um, this is gonna take again, multiple years. I was reading about a, a, a place a nature preserve that was trying to eradicate Japanese knotweed from their trails with black plastic. And I think it took them about five years. Um, and that actually, they also ended up hitting it with some herbicide, I think after five years. They, they, when they removed the plastic after a couple of years, they actually found a couple of sort of uh, living plants underneath it. Okay. And you must maintain it. Once you, you can't just put this down and then forget about it. You've got to maintain it as we'll see. Uh, you also have to extend it beyond the infestation area. So you're going to lose some lawn or some other vegetation um, as a result of this. But re again, remember that knotweed is going to extend its rhizomes. And if you're killing off a little cluster of plants, it's going to kind of try to work its way past that. Okay. So this is a, a, a improperly maintained um, black plastic. I'm, I'm giving them an effort, but on the right hand side, you see that it's either been torn or was lifted up. Uh, we have a chat here. Let's just see. 
Does it stay down without disturbance for five years or so is the question. Yes. Um, I, I mean, I think what you can do is if, if you're seeing that your plastic is starting, if it needs to be replaced, you can pick it up and, and replace it. You can pick it up and look underneath it to see how things are going, but you know, you're not going to take it off and, and try to let other things grow after year one or so. You're going to leave it out there for pretty much the, the, the entire time until, you know, again, checking it periodically. Okay. Uh, so uh, in this case, again, on the right hand side, you see where the plastic is torn or lifted up and these greenery, that is Japanese knotweed that is popping back up. Okay. Um, you can also see how the knotweed is growing out from underneath um, because probably this was not uh, wide enough. So the knotweed is just, just kind of shifted and gone kind of outside of the black plastic. Uh, you can also see that in this case, there was, you know, they, they left a gap between two different uh, sheets of plastic and there's some grass in there and stuff, but there is also some knotweed. This kind of broadleaf stuff in here is, is knotweed that is popping up in here. Okay, so this is a, a process again that has to be done carefully. Uh, you can't leave gaps between your sheets of plastic. You have to extend it further than your original infestation area um, and you have to maintain it. Actually, I, I didn't include the picture, but I found uh, on this sheet, there's one spot where there's a hole that's maybe three inches wide in there and there's a knotweed plant coming right out of that. Maybe the knotweed made the hole, I'm not even sure. This plastic felt a little thin. Uh, thinner than seven mils, but it can work. Okay, um, I've also seen people who have suggested using cardboard uh, sheets of, of cardboard or old carpets. Um, I don't know how well that has worked. Okay. Um, there we go. Uh, when we come to biological, biological is using living organisms to control it. And actually technically goats may not be considered as biological control in quite the same way uh, that people mean when they're talking about um, uh, invasive species. But goats have been used uh, to control invasive species, a number of, of different species. National Park Service has been experimenting with this over the last three or four years in some of their facilities. Um, I actually did find, I don't know if they're, lo they're not local, but I did find a, uh, what did they call themselves, uh, escape goats or something like that, uh, where they would bring um, goats to your property, rent a goat herd for a week, and they fence off the area that they want the goats to feed on. Um, the goats will love Japanese knotweed, and apparently they are also pretty good for the soil between their manure and trampling and aerating the soil. Um, I don't know about the costs of goats. And, and again, I don't know if there's any, I know there are some people with goats locally, but I don't know that they necessarily um, have branched into this, but it's definitely something worth looking into, particularly if you have a large patch that is, um, you know, beyond your, some of your other control means. Okay. Uh, there is also new word on biological control. The Japanese knotweed psyllid. And this is sort of what people are really, really talk about when they say biocontrols. Um, the Japanese knotweed psyllid is a plant louse, a uh, tiny little plant louse that, that is native to the area that uh, our Japanese knotweed is native to. It feeds on Japanese knotweed. It has been tested extensively and found to at least uh, in controlled conditions does not feed on anything else. It does not feed on our native plants. Okay. Um, so it's a feeding specialist on the Japanese knotweed and the giant knotweed and the, the bohemian knotweed. Okay. It was licensed for use in the United Kingdom since 2010. They have a terrible problem with uh, Japanese knotweed in uh, England. Um, okay. Uh, and it was the first uh, bio, it was the first insect used, uh, approved to control plants, weed plants in the European Union ever. Okay. Um, we're a little slower for that, uh, but, but some of the studies have indicated that it shows a 50% reduction in the above ground biomass. Um, and again, that feeding behavior by this plant, by this insect, will um, disrupt the flow of nutrients and it will result in a uh, reduction in 
food storage in the rhizomes and thus controlling the growth of this plant over time. Okay. Um, it has been approved for release in the United States and actually a uh, back in June, I'm trying to remember, I think 500 of them were released, I can't remember where, in New York State. And it's showing promise. They, they have found that these critters have laid eggs and they are feeding on the Japanese knotweed. They are not feeding on natives. Again, it's been extensively tested. So there's definitely hope for the future with this. Now, the biocontrols ultimately mean that, that Japanese, as I said, Japanese knotweed is not going to go away. These, these um, insects are not going to eliminate it entirely, but what they can hopefully do is keep it from becoming um, so extensive and, and so widespread. And I see we have a question. Does the psyllid get at the rhizomes as well? No, the psyllid feeds uh, on the uh, vegetation. Uh, on the above ground portion of the plant. So again, what that's going to do is as it impacts the plant and uh, affects the plant's growth, that's going to impact how much nutrient is getting sent back down to the roots. So it's sort of, you know, like if you have a, if you have a flower, you know, some plants in your garden that are having difficulty with the leaves, you know, the, 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 the overall health of the plant is going to decline or trees that are being defoliated by caterpillars, let's say. Um, you know, the overall health of that tree is going to decline over, over the course of the season. So it won't eliminate the Japanese knotweed, but it, it can uh, keep it under control. And they're pretty, they're pretty uh, bullish on this one. They, they think that this is going to be, you know, again, pretty successful. At the same time, they are still studying other organisms and looking for other uh, potential um, controls for, for Japanese knotweed. Okay. Um, I will add that, you know, success is possible um, between biological controls such as the psyllid potentially curbing knotweed populations um, and dedicated effort. What we see on the right is where we kind of where we started on this little slope at Mohican Farm and on the left is, you know, post-treatment. Now, again, this is, this is year one. In that case, uh, the plant does, is coming back, but it is definitely each time we do this, each time we go through a season of, of chopping and uh, uh, eliminating, you know, the above ground growth, the, the, what comes back the following year is less vigorous and less, uh, you know, a, a, a little less extensive. Uh, I did see something pop up in the chat again. Whoops. I think. I'm not seeing. Oh, there it is. Wait. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my chat control. Sorry. This is this apparently is going to take me a minute here for some reason. Jeff, I'll read it. Okay, there we go. Just jump in. <laughs> okay. The question yep. was, can it be burned? Um, well, can it be burned? Knotweed, growing knotweed has a uh, very high moisture content and does not burn well. I will tell you that the first year that we did this project at Mohican, we cut a lot of this out and we did try burning it. And in addition to being a smoldery fire, it stank. It was very, very unpleasant, uh, unpleasant smell. Um, I don't think it was necessarily bad, you know, like a, a, any sort of poison or toxin, but it really, really stank. And the neighbors were kind of like, what's going on up there? Um, it, it has been recommended for use in some cases as a fire break because it, you know, because it's not, going to burn really well. Um, I think what we did not try is, you know, we did not try drying it out and then burning it. That might work pretty well um, if you can really effectively dry it out and then it might not be so stinky. Um, for any, any sort of burning of, of that sort, you would need to check with your local regulations on what, you know, on brush burning and such and with the state as far as when that is, uh, when, when you can do that. And we just had another question pop up and I just, I'm having, like I said, I'm having trouble seeing my control. Oh, wait, here we go. So maybe I can get that. Here we go. 
Uh, did you get the outcome at Mohican Farm by cutting in? Um, yeah, the, the patch that's shown in the picture uh, was exclusively cutting and digging only. Okay, um, but again, this was, you know, we started on a small effort in 2015, and after that, we we had, um, uh, in one case, we had a crew that was out like once a week for much of the summer digging, and then we had we have had a couple of smaller uh, smaller uh, pulls and 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 digging. So um, yes, that is that that part of it is exclusive. Now, one of the other parts. Um, we had we had chopped it down, and then the the uh, late in the summer, the um, managers at Mohican actually did spray, um, and you know we did see the same thing. It was coming back the following year, but much much less vigorously, and that was the one where the first year he did it. I think I think he did it one year without us cutting it, and that was when you know he was spraying you know six to eight foot high knotweed. And the following year, when he did it after we we had cut it a couple of times in the summer, he said, "Wow." He says, I used much, much, much less. Um, so, uh, Joan asked, is dry knotweed a fire hazard? I would expect it would be, yes. Um, I, I have not heard of too many fires, you know, forest fires or anything started, you know, as a result of knotweed, but that stuff, when it is dry, it, it, it's pretty dry and I would think it would burn pretty easily. Yeah. Um, and let me see, let me see if I can pop in those DEC guidelines here. I'm going to have to copy this. Uh, this may take me a minute. And if anybody has any other questions, as uh, please chime in. Oops. Sorry, I'm trying to type this as I go. Normally I have this preloaded, but today I don't. Got to make sure I spell this right too. Yeah. Yes. I'll ask a question Oops. if I can while you're yep. doing that. That should be PDF at the end, not PDG. <laughs> Yes, go ahead, Maureen. Um, if you're using the soil solarization, mm -hmm. is it best to do it in April then? Cut the little baby things and then, or does it matter if you're going, because I think it's the hot sun that helps get things baked. Right, right. The sun is, the sun and the sealed up in the bag is going to uh, really do the work on, on, on breaking that down. Um, the advantage to starting early on that, though, is that you're going to be dealing with a much smaller plant and a much tougher plant, so uh, or much less tough. So if you cut into a Japanese knotweed stem now, um, you know you tend to get sharp edges on it, and if you then put that in a bag, you can be poking holes in the bags. Let's say. Um, so, and that, that will allow air to get in and it will slow down, it will slow down the process. So, um, by cutting it earlier, uh, a little bit earlier, it's, it's going to be a little more flexible. It's going to be a little less robust. And then if you do it a second time and a third time, let's say, um, each time you're still, you're, it's a small amount of growth as opposed to something that's, you know, an inch across and, and very sturdy and very sharp. So. What, what I meant was uh laying down the black plastic as a barrier. oh oh i'm sorry i, I misunderstood okay. um well i think i think you would you can start that early too um and again what you're doing is you're depriving the sunlight you're depriving you know depriving sun and, and moisture um so the stuff will the stuff will attempt to grow underneath there. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. And I don't know if there's a certain degree of light that actually gets through, even through black plastic that allows it to, to you know, expend energy, or if it's just expending so much energy from the root mass that it's, you know, trying to work its way out. Um, but yeah, if you start early, it'll, it'll help suppress that growth from the beginning. Yeah, so, okay, thanks. Um, let's see, half inch wire mesh as a control. I have not heard of that, uh, Joan. Um, I will look into like like something like a hardware cloth or something, I guess. Um, 
I saw it on YouTube and it, it looks effective, huh. but it looks re ridiculously expensive and difficult. Um, right. Because you have to keep it down for five years and I can imagine it becomes a tangle of Oh, because other things are going to grow through it too. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. I had not. I had not heard of of using wire mesh. I'm going to take a look at that though, because that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, strangling the plant. Yeah. Plant. And uh, okay, I had also had a question of can the ground be burned and scorch the roots? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> So that was a, a question that, that came in privately. I'm not really sure that you would want to do that. Um, and I'm not sure how effective that would be based on simply because of the extension, the extensiveness of the root system. It probably would not be practical. Okay. So I did, I did post the guidelines for DEC. Just note that I made a mistake. I all the way on the last one, it should finish off as dot PDF. Um, and I have a typo in DEC guidelines because of course I do. <laughs> okay. um, and, you know, I know sometimes I, when people hear that I'm advocating for, you know, we're trying to eliminate knotweed in this patch or that patch, I've had people call me and say, well, you know, medicinal value or, you know, good, good honey from the, uh, from the flowers, you know, with, with bees or, um, uh, you know, it's edible. So, you know, don't, you know, you don't have to go after it. The, the simple fact of the matter is we're not getting rid of it entirely. You know, we know we'll never get rid of it entirely. So there will be knotweed to, to bring your beehives out to um, or knotweed to forage for and, and make a, you know, wild edible dish or, or, or such. So, you know, it, we're not going to be able to get rid of it entirely, you know, but we do, I, I think it's well worth trying to control. So, because we, you know, we can certainly say, I think any one of us who lives in Otsego County, you can, drive along and see large parts along the road that are that are just you know swathed in knotweed or if you take a canoe trip down many many of our rivers and creeks you'll find large areas of the stream bank that are just you know covered um so you know i i understand that it, that it does have a certain degree of value for other other things and uh, you know we're but it, it will be there. <laughs> so it's, it's not going to go away. Okay. Um, and does anybody have any other questions? I just do want to let you know a couple of events coming up. We have a uh, paddle and pull at Silver Lake where we're removing invasive water chestnut and European frogbit uh, over New Berlin. Uh, a comprehensive plan webinar on August 19th. Uh, water, each Wednesday in August at 9.30 are Watershed Wednesdays that we're offering in, in uh, partnership with the Upper Susquehanna Coalition, which highlights different topics in our watershed area. Uh, and we have a Butternut Creek paddle on September 27th. We're hoping we can, hoping that we can do this one in person. Um, so uh, information is available on our website. We also have some uh, webinars from the uh, Heat Smart Otsego on clean heating and cooling technologies. So, um, does anybody else have any other questions? I just have a quick one. Yep. Um, so you said it's in the um, the buckwheat family. Yes. And and what was that property where it kills weeds? Allopathic. Oh, allopathy. Yes. Allopathic. Allopathic. Okay. It, it's allopathic. So, uh, a lot. Uh, you know, I think we're learning more and more that that plants are waging all kinds of chemical warfares on insects and fungi and each other. Um, and and I, I know there's 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 a, I, I've learned a lot in recent years over, over this. And you know, we've known certain species like the black walnut does it. So you you know you often don't find a lot of things growing well around walnut. Uh, Norway maple is another invasive that that exhibits this behavior. Um, but not weed, not weed is also one of them. Uh, it, you know, it's a method of self-protection and also, you know, cutting out the competition. Yeah, I found that interesting because I just planted buckwheat in my garden uh -huh. after pulling, pulling uh, garlic and stuff so that it would keep weeds down and be a green manure crop. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize it was in the same family. Right. It is in the same family, but it may not exhibit those same behaviors. Um, the, that, that's a pretty big family, so. 
Yeah, okay. It is supposed to be a leopathic, though, mm -hmm. buckwheat, right. what I was told. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Anybody I else? Well, I, I thank everybody for, for coming. I hope you found this helpful and interesting. And, and uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're doing battle with knotweed on a property, we'd always love to hear about it and, and find out how it's working for you, what you're doing and whether it's working. Um, so there we go. So thank you very much. And we will have this recording available up on YouTube so you can check it out again another time. Thank you. You're welcome. But my welcome, am I my walnut? I didn't mention what I do. <laughs> um. Thank you, Jeff. All right, Thank you're you. welcome. Thank you, everybody.